Welcome. We have Caitlin McKeague on here again. Am I saying that right? McKeague or McKaig? It's McKaig, but you know, okay. McKaig, McKeague, same thing. Yeah, well, I get McCone, <laughs> McChewin, Mahoney. Uh, mine gets oh, butchered all the time, but it's good to see you again. Yes, you too. I'm glad we could do this. I think last time we did this was probably towards the end of the year last year, talking about predictions and that kind of thing. So it's always nice to get together and um, talk about what we're seeing out there. Yeah. Is, uh, is 2023 lining up like you thought it was or like me, were your predictions way off? Yeah. Um, I think my prediction was off. I mean, is anyone ever right? It's always luck if you are, in my opinion, but I, I don't think I anticipated as much growth in sales prices this year. I thought it was going to be kind of stable. Um, certainly didn't expect us to like shoot out like a rocket for the first six months of the year and then uh, slow down as much as we have. So, and I did think we would start to see rates coming down by this time this year too. So yeah, I was wrong. <laughs> well, I, I always like to start like in December and show what all the big guys are predicting, CoreLogic, Zillow and Bloomberg and, and all the banks and, and then going back and looking at it. And every year they're wrong. And, and CoreLogic, is the core logic core logic seems to have the biggest miss but even this year really as a surprise to me but the mortgage bankers association is was predicting as early as last month that mortgage rates will be down to 5.9 percent uh in the fourth quarter so they've got like a week <laughs> and we're at 7.5 or five Seven point six five right now as we speak on Wednesday, the twenty seventh. Lovely. So, yeah, I don't see that uh, coming down anytime soon. Uh, <laughs> that would be that would be insane if it came down that much that fast. No way. Yeah, you'd have to have some insane uh, um, numbers show up to make it do that. You got one here that I'm going to just share real quickly here, and that is um, the ten year note. 10 year treasury yield. And, you know, a lot of traders like to use, follow this thing called the 200 day moving average right there. And usually when it breaks out, you know that, you know, it's going to take off. And it sure did. Look at that. Just went boom, 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 mm -hmm. above 4.5. So there's uh, the party of low interest rates is definitely taking a hiatus. But now I'm seeing, um, and I know you look at the same data I am, that our sales are as low as they've ever been. Is that what it seems like to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Transactions are the biggest thing that's suffering in this market. And I think people always focus on buyers or sellers, but really it's the transactions is like what has crashed, so to speak, if you want to, if you want to call it that. Yeah. The prices have held up just because, you know, we don't have enough inventory out there, but uh, are you seeing, um, agents dropping out of the, the field? I haven't connected with anyone that's, that's dropped out personally. I know there's a lot of talk about it. How about you? Have you, do you know anyone who's stopped working? I don't know anybody. I mean, I've talked to a few that, you know, are, are feeling, you know, pretty, pretty gloomy about it. Um, I, it's interesting. I'm, and you're probably in a bunch of Facebook groups too, but you see the comments on there. You can always tell the new ones that got in and they're like, what do I do to find buyer leads? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the overall agent sentiment is down. I will say that. Uh, and same with lenders too. Uh, it's really that's hard on lenders right now. Um, title and escrow, all of us, it, we're the ones that feel it the most. That's for sure. Uh, but yeah, it, it would be a very tough thing to have entered this market as an agent in 2020 or 2021, because you had to, you, you did, you got a lot of clients probably, but you also had to learn so fast and in such an abnormal market that all of that, that you learned is not true for a normal market. So now you're not only relearning how to even do a transaction for the most part, but also you're having to figure out how to prospect that you probably didn't have to do that as much before. 
Yeah, I think a lot of people think that, you know, once you get your real estate license, you just stand on your front porch and go, hey, I'm a realtor and your family and friends will follow you. And usually they don't because they know that you just got into real estate. So <laughs> they're not going to touch you with a 10 foot pole for a while. And mm -hmm. uh, no matter how close of a family member you are. Um, mm -hmm. But all of a sudden things change and, you know, they don't teach you how to really conduct the business in real estate school, do they? Not at all. No. You learn how many square feet are in an acre or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is that they, you learn and you never use it again. And then you are thrown out to the real world and you have no idea how to write a contract or what it means and let alone find anyone that wants to work with you to buy or sell. It's it's a pretty harsh reality. And I will, I'll be the first to admit, like when I first started, I was like, what the, like, why is this as hard as it is? I didn't think it was going to be this hard. <laughs> well, I kept, I kept, people kept saying, well, you'll find it on the MLS. It's on the MLS. I got to be honest with you. I, I didn't know where the MLS was or how to access it. <laughs> and I went down and I, I, you know, I got my license. So I went down to the association and paid my association dues and got my login information and all that. And even then she said, now you can just go into the MLS and, uh, you know, start searching for homes and set up this and that. And I looked at her and I go, can you show me how to do that? And what everybody's talking about? I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you don't have a mentor or someone that's actually going like a broker that will actually take the time to teach you, <clears throat> you're, you're kind of on your own and just figure things out or, or you, you quit, I guess. Um, it's yeah, it's very, it's not a warm welcome. I'll say that. Well, the market really <laughs> changed too. I mean, you know, I, I got in 2012 and Zillow was ramping up pretty good then, but you could run ads on Zillow for like 150 bucks a month in certain zip codes. And uh, so you could run an ad in a certain, a lot of people don't know this, but the agents that you see on Zillow are only popping up there because they're buying that space. Mm -hmm. So you get calls from people, Hey, I'm calling about your listing on blah, blah, blah street. And you go, well, I don't have a listing there. Yeah, you do. Um, your picture's right next to it. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a Zillow ad. No, no, your picture's right. Up. Okay. Uh, can you tell them to stop parking their landscaping truck in front of my house? Uh, <laughs> that's an actual phone call. I had. I go, sure. I'll get right on it. But oh boy. <laughs> now you can't touch a Zillow lead or a Zillow uh, ad, ad for what? Less than 1500 a month. Oh yeah. Yeah. I would say that for sure. If not more, yeah. And, and there aren't really any zip codes to buy anymore. It sounds like, like, I don't even think there's anything available in some of those like popular zip codes because all the big teams spend a ton of money buying up all the bad space there. Yeah. So, pulling their money. Yeah. So, so let me ask you this as we're going into the end of the year here. I mean, we're, we're as slow as we've ever been. Now I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think uh, uh, we were way too frothy, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not bemoaning where we're at, but where do you see the rest of the year kind of lining out? I think it's going to remain slow. Uh, and I'm surprised. I thought that we would start to see a little bit of a pickup in September, October, and I we're not seeing what I thought. So my guess is that what we see today is probably going to be the remainder of the year because once we get in the holidays, it never gets never gets any more exciting. It's kind of dies out through the rest of the year in terms of transactions and, um, you know, even, even sales, um, uh, numbers and whatnot, because there's fewer buyers out there and people just, it becomes a little bit more of a balanced market. It seems like in the last couple of months of the year. So I think the rest of the year is going to be kind of not underwhelming, not very exciting. And unless we have some sort of surprise with interest rates, I think that's kind of where we're at. What do you think? Well, I think there's there's not a lot of um, data that I'm seeing that shows that interest rates have pressure to come back down. I'm seeing the opposite. Um, you know, our, our, our job numbers are still healthy. Uh, inflation is still above the target. Uh, and the bond traders that control um, you know, the buying and selling of bonds and rates more so than, than the central bank are, 
are really in the camp that says we're going to be here for a while. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then add to that, the fact that we have, it's kind of, it's not really too difficult to explain, but when we had that, um, budget negotiation, um, everything was frozen. So no money was going into the treasury. And then all of a sudden they reached a miraculous agreement. And now the treasury goes, well, our checking accounts about a trillion dollars short. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to quickly sell $1 trillion of treasuries so we can fill it back up. Well, that put upward pressure on rates. And so, uh, and we're still not, not out from underneath that. So I think that environment is going to be with us uh, now and through the first quarter of next mm -hmm. year. And November, December is a great time to hunker down and finish all your continuing education credits. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yay. <laughs> I just got mine done. Took me way too long to get through them. I was like, I'm not going to leave them to the last minute. And I did. I do that every time. Not going to leave in the last minute. Now I am in December, but I still have another year left. So I'm going to try and, and get caught up this year. But I think yeah. um, now for first time home buyers, um, what, what do you tell them when they say, I'm not sure, should I wait? Um, should I get in? Uh, where do you think things are going? What do those conversations look like? Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, you have to do what's right for you and where you're at financially. So it's very hard to advise anyone else. Um, and I, I never want to be someone that, that gives someone the wrong information because truthfully, I don't know where things are going. No one can really predict it. So, but I do think if you are in a position financially that is comfortable for you um, and your family and uh, you plan to buy a home that's a permanent residence uh, long-term for yourself, I don't think it's a bad time to buy because I do think rates will come down. We're not going to see 3% rates, but they will come down and you can refinance eventually. I don't think we're going to see a crash in home prices um, of any significance, uh, maybe more correction continuing on, maybe some softening. But if you're going to be in the house long-term, um, you know, I don't think it's going to be anything that would affect you. So as a first time home buyer, what, what I would do if I felt comfortable financially, I would buy now, I would plan to refinance in the future because I think what's going to happen is rates will eventually come down. And I think we do have a lot of pent up demand and I don't think that we've gained the supply that we need and we'll end up seeing the demand go up again and the prices start to go up again. And so I guess you kind of have to pick your poison. Do you want to pay a high price and a lower rate or you want to pay, you know, maybe a lower price and uh, a higher rate with the opportunity to refinance? So that's what I would do. Yeah. And then, you know, and maybe the opportunity to refinance may not show up for quite some time too. I've been mm -hmm. in that situation where I, I thought, well, I can get in because I have to, because I was moving. I, I did five corporate relocations. Wow. So, so when you do that, you're not in a situation. I mean, I suppose you can say, well, I'm not going to buy, but you know, I moved to Southern California. I didn't want to rent. I didn't want to rent. I looked at rentals when I went to upstate New York and, and, uh, finally just decided to buy cause it was actually cheaper to buy way cheaper than it was to rent because there weren't any rentals available. Um, and at the time, I mean, I just, I didn't follow interest rates. I said, well, what am I going to pay? And I just looked at, looked at the payment today because of the information that we can all get. Everybody's really drilled in plus 2008 still right here. So trying to find a strategy is, I think it's, you know, more challenging. I know that I kind of crunched some numbers this morning and said, well, um, you know, you, you gotta, like you just said, you gotta be, it's gotta fit your situation. So how long do you want to stay there? Um, five to eight years, uh, two years. I had a, a veteran call me once said he was, he, he was active military said he was only going to be here two years. And I said, don't buy, this was last year. And I said, you know, real estate may go up and you'll be, be fine. But I said, for you to get over the fees, um, you're going to have to have a lot of appreciation. So I might, I I'm going to tell you to rent. Mm hmm. Yeah, I I agree. It's not for everyone right now. And there is a lot of uncertainty. So you can't just 
give blanket advice that now is a good time to buy because you can refinance. And the biggest argument to that is you can't refinance if your your house is underwater, if your value goes down too. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, like I said, I don't think we're going to see significant price declines to where everyone's in that situation right when rates drop too. But um, you know, it's something to consider. What do you think about affordability? Because that's what I hear from a lot of people, whether they're clients or just on social media, it's always a talk about, you know, things aren't affordable. Um, we have no affordability uh, nationally. No one can buy a house. The young people are screwed over. Like, what are your thoughts on affordability? Well, we've hit the wall. There's no doubt. Um, you know, it's what affordability. I mean, I ignore the price of the house and just go, what, what's the percentage of your income, you know, your monthly payment to your income? And not only just your mortgage, but everything else. And with gas prices and food prices and insurance prices and everything up as high as they are now, we've we've hit a wall. It's knocked a lot of people out of the market um, for all the wrong reasons. Um, a lot of the run up that we had in prices were people that just kind of were going to buy like two years later. But because rates got so low, they jumped in then and they made a good move. They got locked in a low interest rate. But it drove prices up because of the, you know, the shortages of inventory that we had. Now you're sitting there, you're trying to get in and you just can't afford it. There's only two choices. Wait till house prices come down if they come down or wait and see if in your journey at work that you start getting a raise and another raise and a promotion. And I mean, that's the only thing that saved my bacon was I was getting promoted and, uh, um, you know, the first job never would have sustained me in, in purchasing a house, not until I, you know, moved up the ladder a couple of times. So, but that's a little, it's been a little harder for a lot of people at this point. And I think affordability is our big issue. And the other thing is too, is a lot of first time home buyers have saddled themselves with huge car payments, mm -hmm. you know, 800 to a thousand bucks. And mm -hmm. that's just the payment. What's the car insurance? Because, you know, your, your insurance down here is much higher than other states. And I don't know if people are aware of that, but when I moved from Seattle down to here, or from here, from Seattle to California, my car insurance went um, up. And then when I moved to Arizona from New York, it went up like three, threefold. Wow. And it was, uh, and it, you know, car theft, I guess, is what, uh, which I thought car theft. And then a month Great. later, somebody stole my car. <laughs> no way. Oh, right out my of my gosh. driveway. So, uh, so yeah. So to answer your question, affordability, there's, there's nothing fake about it. It's there. It's hitting us in the face and uh, nobody's trying to be a big economist. They're all sitting back and going, I don't know what's going on. I know I just can't play in this market. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I was I saw an article lately that was um, about millennials feeling like they missed the golden opportunity of buying. Uh, and I, I did a little video on this on TikTok and on YouTube shorts. And then Gen Z feels like or Gen Z basically is none the wiser was kind of the, the thing. So like millennials ha have PTSD from 2008 and they didn't buy a house during the time that they could have because 2008 was looming and or they got into the job market at a time when it wasn't great because we were coming out of that recession. So their earning potential hasn't really met what it should have met. But then you have Gen Z who didn't really live through 2008 and uh, hasn't really been paying attention to interest rates or anything like that, but now they're coming of age to where they can buy. So they're kind of like, sure, like this sounds great. I, I could do it. I I'll buy. And then millennials are like, I missed it. I need to find a 3% rate again. And they're not going to buy till they can get that. So it's two different perspectives between the generations, um, which I find interesting. I, I don't know how much truth there is to that, but that's what that well, I, think, was. I think there is, because I ran into a lot of that of people saying, well, you know, 2008, 2008. And I, and I think there just never was a grasp of what it really was that caused that crash. They just think and thought that it was a, a uh, an occurrence that happened several times. Now, mm -hmm. I've been in up markets and down markets to where I can tell you that, you know, 
yes, 2008 was pretty steep, but you know what? 1994 was no picnic either. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it didn't wipe out areas as bad as 2008 did, and it didn't last as long. But uh, um, if you stay put and you have a fixed rate, you can just look at all this nonsense out your window and be fine. And there was this, they, people really didn't understand that if you had a fixed rate, you can watch your house value erode. Who cares? It's like your 401k. Don't look at it. Um, well, but in 2008, uh, your payment changed. That's what the problem was. You got in, your payment was 650 bucks a month. Then you got a letter that says now it's going to be 1100. What? Well, you signed that doc. It was an adjustable rate mortgage. There's none of that going on now. So the people that got in in 21 and, and 20 and 22, um, even if the market goes down 10, 15%, they've got nothing to worry about. They can just stay there. Mm -hmm. Nobody, uh, well they're not going to get that letter. That's why we're in the position that we're in without any inventory right now, because no one wants to give up those rates. And I know I feel like I'm beating a dead horse as I say that because it's the topic of conversation in so many articles and news headlines. And, you know, people hear about it all the time. Like it's, it's not new news, but it's the truth. And like, I, I know it's the truth. I talked to so many people about it and I'm one of those people. Like I, I'm part of the problem. I would love to buy a new house um, that's a little bit bigger, but like I really don't want to give up the rate that I have. And when I look at what seven and a half percent would be on what I want to buy, that looks really ugly. And um, I also would prefer to keep my house as a rental and own two properties, but I can't really afford to do that if I have to pay seven and a half percent rate. And, you know, you go around in circles, try to figure out what you want to do. And ultimately you're like, guess we'll just make this work. Guess we'll just stay. And I know so many people are doing that. Um, so it's just really not opening up inventory. No one really has the incentive unless you have to for a job transfer, a death, a divorce, like those kinds of life events that you can't get around. Otherwise, it's not very exciting to do. <laughs> yeah. And baby boomers typically sell their house and downsize, but now, especially, you know, people I talk to in my class, cause we're, we're right at the beginning of that baby boomer stuff and, and, uh, got this big house, but they got grandkids. They go, well, you know, we were going to sell this and we were going to, you know, get something smaller, but we, we like having the extra room for the grandkids. Mm -hmm. And so there are, there's, quite a few baby boomers that are entertaining selling their home to move closer to their grandkids. If their kids have a career where they know they're going to stay put, there's a lot of that going on. Uh, my best friend is talking about doing that and moving, you know, he's got, uh, you know, three grandkids in another state. So he's looking at, at making that kind of a move. And I see a lot of that, but other than that, everybody's just staying put. Mm -hmm. like, well, you know, I was going to get something smaller. I'd like to get a town home. I don't want any lawn. Uh, this thing is two stories. You know, my knees are barking, uh, but gosh, I got a good rate. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> or and it's or paid off. Yeah, that, that too. Or you're going to pay more monthly to downsize and have something smaller because prices have gone up so much. So you're just... <laughs> paying more for something for, for less really. So I would, I would go back and, and uh, the advice to the younger generation is it's always tough. My first payment on my new house was brutal. Um, I paid 103,000 for it in Seattle and that thing's probably worth 700, 800,000. Now I'm, I haven't even looked it up, but I'm, I'm betting that's, that's what it is. And it, it would have been paid off many times over by now. Mm -hmm. So I would have been sitting here in a seven or $800,000 home with no mortgage, just paying taxes. And I would have ridden this through at least five major downturns in the housing market. Mm -hmm. there I would you have go. written, written the downturn in uh, um, the mid eighties. We kind of had a little bit of a dip, We had that savings and loan crisis that caused some problems. Big dip in 1994. Uh, we had the, um, I'm just going to say we had four or five opportunities where house prices went up and then they came down. But at the end of the day, it's like Will Rogers used to say a long time ago. He goes, buy land. They stopped making it a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so so I think we've got to get, we've, 
and I'm not trying to tell people now's the time to buy. Don't get me wrong, but the mentality has to shift that the house is not the stock market. Mm -hmm. And for sellers, everybody wants that peak time to sell at the top of the market. And I had a father, I was a commodity trader once. And he said, all you need is that chunk out of the middle. Mm -hmm. You're never going to buy, you know, sell at the top and buy at the bottom. You need that chunk out of the middle, but we've taken this long-term home ownership and tried to squeeze it into two and five year increments. Mm hmm. Yep. 2008 made that worse. Yeah. Yep. And everyone got a taste of some good appreciation and a low interest rate. And I think exactly what you said, it's not the stock market and people expect, or, you know, if that's all you've been exposed to, you kind of expect more of an overnight return on, on things, um, or quicker return, um, or being able to trade houses like you would stocks. And you can't think of it that way. Um, Otherwise, you're one of those people saying it's unaffordable or you're going to lose money or, you know, all those things. Well, we started out saying how slow the market is, right? Mm -hmm. That it's, it's just really slow. But for sellers, um, while it's really slow, homes are still moving. Mm -hmm. there, we still only have a, what is it, a 2.6 month supply of homes? Somewhere in there, yep. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking of selling and you're hearing all this noise that things are really bad for a seller, they're not really bad, are they? Mm -mm. No, not bad at all. Not bad at all. I, in fact, I mean, this was a month, month, two month, month and a half ago. Um, and I shared this on my channel. My listing in Chandler went over the asking price with five. I think we ended up with five offers. Um, and some contingencies waived and, uh, you know, it was really competitive. Now it was a great house, but like that wouldn't, if we were in a bad market, doesn't matter how great the house is, that type of behavior wasn't going to happen. So it's, things are moving. There are buyers out there. It's just a matter of location price. And of course the quality of the house too. Well, the biggest indicator to me that I look at, and I know you watch this too, and that is the Cromford market index. And mm -hmm. the red number is, is a demand and the blue, the blue dots are, are supply, right? Mm -hmm. And you can see that right here, there was a brief period in 2022 where the blue line went above the red line. And that's when we had our decrease in prices. Mm -hmm. Now, right now they're starting to go in that direction yet again, but they haven't crossed yet. So as long as there's a gap, um, you don't mm -hmm. see prices fall. You saw them fall here briefly back in 2014. You saw them absolutely crater here mm -hmm. and prices explode here. So, I mean, without knowing any economic theory or real estate or financing, this says everything. It does. And what's so important that I love to point out is that the supply is over the demand when you look back in 2008, right? Like that is a flipped scenario to what we have right now. We have demand over supply right now. And we have since we recovered from that. Um, and so when people reference 2008, it's, it's a completely, it's a 180 from where we're at right now. Um, and like you said, they crossed very slightly in 2022. That's where we saw price softening. So it's that's really the key factor is looking. I mean, <laughs> 2008 just looks crazy on this graph. Well, and you could take this same graph if they if we had it, but we didn't have back then. I bet you could go back to 1980 and you won't see any extremes like that one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We had yeah. 58,000 listings in our market and sales were down to about 2,700 every seven days, mm -hmm. just like we are now. Right now, we're 2,400 every seven mm -hmm. days. If we had 58,000 listings, yeah, we'd be in big trouble. Mm -hmm. And, and I, oh, go I, ahead. do you remember in 2012, 13, and 14, shadow inventory? I No, because I wasn't around in 2012, 13, and 14, honestly. <laughs> Everybody was warning us, shadow inventory is coming. There's uh -huh. all these homes that are out there. That investors took on, they took them out as rentals and they're waiting and they're going to mm -hmm. dump them all on the market. Everybody was just all fidgety about that. And it never appeared because rent started going up and they hung on to it. Mm -hmm. There was yeah. no shadow. And it's kind of like now with foreclosures. 
Yes. I was going to ask you about foreclosures, but you know what? The shadow inventory narrative continues today. We still hear that. I've I've heard a lot of that. I've heard a lot about um, foreclosures. I've heard a lot about Airbnb crashing the market. Um, it's just funny. It's like a on a rotation of like, what, what can we talk about that's going to be the next crash? I feel bad for these YouTubers that are trying to create these things because they're, they've got to be stressed out at a certain point. Like I, okay, that didn't come true. So now what else can I do and gloom about? I got to figure out <laughs> some other story to scare the people. Yeah, It's like, you know, in theory, you can say if, if, if it, Airbnbs all go away, that, that prices will come down. So I have too much inventory in theory until you look at actual numbers. Mm -hmm. And if you look at actual single family homes that are, um, that are Airbnbs, if all of them came on the market tomorrow, uh, we'd still be low of inventory. And yep, not I... only that, the quality of those homes is so good because, you know, they, they usually come with furniture. They've been fixed up. They've been maintained. They, you know, they sell as soon as they hit the market. So mm -hmm. the whole argument doesn't wash for me that Airbnbs are going to crash the market. Mm hmm. Well, also, there's no way that all Airbnbs would be listed in a short period of time. There's no like national regulation that's going to to take that over. There's no way. Um, and I know New York just did did that, and they had a big um, increase, I think, in their supply of Airbnbs. But um, yeah, it's it's not going to be on a national scale that all of a sudden these every Airbnb is listed for sale. Um, even if it was, like you said, they would. They would buy quickly, but but would would they be bought quickly with the interest rate where it is? I don't know. Well, I, I don't know. And getting back to your foreclosure question, uh, here we are. These are notice of trustee sales by month. I need mm -hmm. a magnifying glass to get there. 319. <laughs> so we're not at yep. the uh, 10,558 that, that we were here. So there's, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, they're not everything that they say, and I'm sure we're talking about the same group. Not everything they say is wrong, uh, but there's enough in there that make you go, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I just encourage people to, you know, okay, I'm glad you follow them. That's good. You should. Um, you should read everything. You mm -hmm. should check out what's going on and uh, sort the good out uh, from the bad. But for crying out loud, make your make your own decision. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it just depends on how they're, they can make anything sound doom and gloom and it can be the right data and the right information, but it doesn't mean that it's bad. For example, last year when they were saying supply was skyrocketing and it was whatever percentage higher than it had been in 2021, it's like, well, yeah, because uh, 2021 we had like no inventory and people, and, and now rates went up and the buyers aren't soaking it all up again. But like, like you said, you compare it to 2008 when we had 55,000 or whatever listings. I think we, when they said supply was skyrocketing, I think we had like, I don't know, like 10,000 or 9,000 listings or something just like yes, I, minuscule. I, re I remember the headline that inventory is up 143%. There you and go. I said, good, we need it to be up 350% just to get back to normal. Right, so right. A large percentage of a small number is still a small number. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's mm -hmm. go bring me some more inventory. So, right. Yep. Well, yeah. Caitlin, it's been great to catch up with you and uh, see what's going on. And your little boy is now five months old. Man, mm -hmm. knock me yep. down with a feather. That uh, that went <laughs> quickly. So, but uh, you're telling me, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank well. you for, for chatting. It's always good to talk about what we're seeing in the market and predictions that we have, or not truly predictions, but our, you know, what our gut tells us where yeah, things are going. Yeah, we can, we can get on and share our inter industry struggles. And, in um, it's been, it, it is nice though, to be able to go show home without driving there 90 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. so I, do, I, do I like agree. That. <laughs> love it. <laughs> I love it. Well, good to see you, my friend. And we will chat you again. Too. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Rick. Take care.